It's an honor to give the Lauren D. Sullivan lecture, um, you know, and appreciate the contributions of Dr. Sullivan to your institution and to the field. And as Dr. Black was saying, you know, it's an, it's humbling to be on the list of, um, le you know, lecturers for this series uh, that includes, uh, honestly, giants in the field. And, and like I said, I'm quite humbled to be, in, uh, you know, on that list. Um, you know, just to, uh, to uh, get this out of the way, there's nothing wrong with your Zoom cameras. I do have a black eye, as I was addressing, you know, mentioning earlier. Uh, that is a direct result of uh, me now only starting to realize as I get older that my athleticism coordination is not what it was as my kids is going in the other direction and trying to keep up with them. Uh, luckily, it's, uh, you know, only an injury really to my ego, which as the, those of you there who know me would probably say that there's plenty of room for my ego to take some hits. So it'll be okay. Um, so I'm going to talk today uh, primarily about prostate cancer. Uh, and when we sort of a key, you know, feature of prostate cancer is that this is a clinically heterogeneous disease. And if we had to sort of say, what is the major problem with prostate cancer? That is it. Across the spectrum of disease from very early uh, clinically localized disease to very advanced treatment resistant disease, some patients do quite well and some patients do quite poorly. And understanding who is who is not uh, very clear still to this point. Um, and that leads to several problems and the fundamental thing that we need to move this forward is to have a better understanding of the variable biology that underscores this variable clinical behavior. And it's into this sort of framework that we can start to think about molecular subclassification of this disease. Uh, and this is the basic idea of being able to define distinct classes of prostate cancer based on their molecular and genomic characteristics, really use that information to define distinct subtypes and use that to understand that there is distinct biology within those subtypes. And once we do that, we can have a better understanding of patient prognosis. We can have a better understanding of how to choose management strategies for different subsets of patients and potentially identify legitimate targeted therapies within these different subclasses, the paradigm of precision medicine. So this is not a brand new idea. You know, this is what we utilize in breast cancer in terms of uh, using and identifying clinically relevant subtypes that are identifiable by molecular criteria. It's the way the field works in leukemia, where there are clear subtypes of the disease that have distinct genetic and genomic underpinnings. Now in leukemia, little, the difference is that the hematopathologist can often see under the microscope which of those subtypes is distinct where in prostate cancer, we're not often able to do that. So in terms of going back to this idea, um, everything that I'm gonna talk about today, it's pretty much focused on primary prostate cancer, clinically localized, hormone naive, untreated prostate cancer. Uh, and you know, as we know, that spectrum of biology shifts as we get into treatment resistant disease. So if we look at the genomic landscape of uh, primary prostate cancer, there are many ways to think about subtypes. Uh, one of the ways to think about subtypes of the disease is to look at underlying genomic drivers. Um, one of the reasons I favor this sort of uh, method of classification in my own research is that you can model drivers. Drivers can be taken and put into a model system to see what they do. So if we think about it uh, along the spectrum of data from the TCGA, you know, the two dominant subtypes of the disease are those characterized by recurrent fusions of the oncogenic transcription factor ERG. And the second most common, about 10% of prostate cancer or so, uh, harbors recurrent uh, point mut mutations in a gene called SPOP. So, you know, my laboratory group has focused really heavily on this SPOP mutant subclass of prostate cancer. Uh, 
and tried to use that a little bit as a paradigm of understanding uh, how these subtypes uh, are different. How are they similar? What do we see going on in these subtypes of disease? So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. In terms of what SPOP is and what it does, uh, the SPOP gene encodes the substrate recognition component of an E3 ubiquitin ligase complex. It's comprised of two functional domains, a math domain, which actually binds to the substrates, and a BTB domain, which interacts with the colon 3 core. And together, they uh, promote the uh, ubiquitin tagging of substrates and commonly their degradation. If we look in prostate cancer where the mutations happen in this protein, they're all in the substrate recognition domain or the math domain. They're all in specific hotspot amino acids. And they're all, uh, if you look at the crystal structure, very tightly clustered around the substrate binding cleft, indicating that these are going to affect substrate specificity. Uh, other interesting things about these mutations, they're all pretty much heterozygous, meaning that um, the missense mutation and the wild type allele are both expressed in the same tumors. And it appears these happen pretty early in the natural history of the disease. So with that in mind, uh, several years ago now, we uh, developed a genetically engineered mouse model to study these mutations better in which we knocked in the most common point mutations in prostate cancer into uh, the ROSA26 locus in the mouse in a Cree-inducible manner, and then looked at uh, prostate-specific effects. We were able to get both the in vivo models and in vitro uh, models in terms of mouse prostate organoids from these, uh, this genetically engineered mouse model. And we learned uh, several things from this. Um, the Arguably the most important thing in understanding how these cancers work came from a very simple uh, proteomics experiment we did uh, in collaboration with the Rural Chennaians proteomics group, where we looked at the mouse prostate organoids uh, with Cree-inducible mutant ESPA and just looked at the proteomic level and asked what proteins are going up and what proteins are going down when we turn on this mutation in the mouse prostate, in the mouse prostate cells. And if we look at the proteins that are upregulated when we turn on SPOT mutation, we see, and when we do a network analysis, we see that these proteins are physically and functionally related to the androgen receptor. So if you look at the network, the androgen receptor itself, is sort of the hub of that network. And it's since been shown that many of these proteins are bona fide substrates of SPOP that are deregulated by mutations. Uh, these include the androgen receptor itself, but also many coactivators and cooperating transcription factors like uh, BET bromo domain proteins like BRD2, 3, and 4, like steroid receptor coactivator 3, like the histone acetyltransferase P300, like an oncogenic coactivator TRIM24 and the uh, cooperating transcription factor HOXP13. So that suggests that this is going to change AR signaling, not as simple as just upregulating androgen receptor signaling, but, but somehow by changing the coactivator context around the androgen receptor in these tumors. So, you know, with this group, I may not need too much of an introduction to the androgen receptor and what it does, but, you know, just briefly, Androgen receptor is a driver of prostate cancer and a key therapeutic target, of course, but it's also an important uh, differentiation factor in the normal prostate. So in normal prostate cells, uh, testosterone uh, coming exogenously gets converted in prostate cells to a more active form called dihydrotestosterone. That can bind to the androgen receptor in the cytoplasm, cause its translocation to the nucleus, and allow it to act as a sequence specific transcription factor, binding to these androgen receptor response element motifs. And in the normal prostate, turning on genes that are actually involved in cell cycle arrest, survival and differentiation, uh, PSA or KLK3 is a, is a classic you know, target gene. So in the normal prostate, the androgen receptor signaling is more associated with growth suppression and with differentiation, interestingly. Now, 
A key feature of prostate cancers is that the androgen receptor gets reprogrammed and starts to act more as an oncogenic factor promoting proliferation of these prostate cells. And this work has been done uh, by many groups. Uh, Mark Pomerantz and Matt Friedman have published extensively on this. Uh, David Neal and Ian Mills' group have published extensively on this. Uh, Wilbert Zwart's group has looked at this very heavily. But key, the key here is that androgen receptor reprogramming is an absolutely critical feature of prostate tumor genesis. So really, we really ask the question, uh, how does SPOT mutation affect the AR transcriptional program in normal prostate cells? Again, our best data suggests this is a mutation that happens very early in the natural history of these cancers. So maybe converting a genetically normal cell into the start of a prostate tumor. So how does that affect the AR transcriptional program there? So we turned to our uh, mouse prostate organoid models, again, with Cree-inducible uh, SPOP mutation, where we see about a one-to-one -one ratio of the mutant SPOP to the endogenous mouse SPOP, as we do in human tumors. And we basically looked at either organoids that had SPOP mutation induced with Cree or controls, and then stimulated those with, uh, with androgen or with vehicle and did multi-level uh, transcriptional profiling and chromatin profiling to understand how is the androgen receptor directed program changing when we turn on these SPOT mutations. Um, this is data that was all generated by Ivana Gerbesa, who's a postdoc in my lab. Uh, and it's been kicking around in revisions for about a year now, but hopefully we're, we're coming to the finish line on this. So what we found was that if we look at androgen receptor chip seek, basically, which is the genome wide distribution of where the androgen receptor sits in these normal prostate cells, the SPOT mutant organoids have motifs where the androgen receptor is bound that look very similar to human prostate cancer. So essentially, if we look at androgen receptor peaks in human prostate cancer tissue from Mark Pomerantz and other groups, these are the top three motifs, FOXA1, androgen receptor response elements, and HOXB13. In the SPOT mutant organoids, we see the exact same three top mute motifs, FOXA1, androgen receptor response elements, and HOXB13. In contrast, the control organoids without SPOT mutation their top motifs are actually AP1 motifs and NF kappa B. And that's actually much more similar to normal human prostate tissue than it is to prostate cancer. So this suggests that SPOT mutation alone is sufficient to sort of flip this switch and start driving the androgen receptor systrome to look more like human prostate cancer. When we look at chromatin accessibility with a technique called the taxi, which basically is just looking at open and closed chromatin to get a sense of where the genome is actually being utilized for transcription and for regulatory elements. And we look at the differential attack seek peaks, again, between SPOT mutants and control organoids. We see that the primary differences between these two are not happening in promoters but are instead happening at uh, introns and distal energetic regions consistent with enhancers. And we actually validated that by looking at uh, H3K4 dimethyl chip seek and H3K27 acetyl chip seek in these, again, to confirm that these are active enhancers that are changing. And again, if we look at these uh, change in accessible regions, the dominant signal is the FOXA1 motifs, suggesting that FOXA1 signaling somehow is acting downstream of SPOT mutation to drive these uh, accessibility changes and drive these transcriptional changes. We've since gone to human tumors and looked at human tumors uh, and the differences between SPOT mutant and SPOT wild type tumors and can see a similar thing, that there's a clear difference in FOXA1 uh, driven sort of uh, chromatin accessibility and androgen receptor uh, cystrome in those tumors. Again, consistent with the fact that our model systems are pointing us in this direction, and then we can see the same thing in the human tumors. And then finally, if we look at gene expression prof profiling with RNA-seq and look at the androgen receptor target genes based on this, and one of the ways we, we did this was we actually 
used a set of control organoids where we crispered out the androgen receptor itself to kind of show us the baseline of the true androgen receptor target genes in these. And what we see is that with SPOT mutation, we get an expansion of the androgen receptor transcriptome. And you can see this pretty well in this radar plot where the control organoids, the kind of gene sets that are involved in androgen-driven transcription are shown in blue. And in the SPOT mutants, this expands. We see a little bit of an increase in the classic androgen receptor uh, target genes, but also we see a shift towards more oncogenic gene sets like uh, G2M checkpoints, DNA repair, and UV response, which are all associated with proliferation and S phase. We get a shift towards Wnt and beta catenin signaling. We get an increase in mTOR PI3 kinase signaling, as we described before. Again, consistent with the idea that these SPOT mutations are sufficient to change how the androgen receptor is actually driving transcription and push it towards more proliferative oncogenic transcriptional profiles. So brief conclusions for, uh, for this section. Again, these SPOT mutations are the most common point mutations in prostate cancer. They do look like they define a distinct biological subclass. It's an early clonal alteration uh, that changes altered expression of AR and its cofactors. And in genetically normal cells, we're able to see that these SPOT mutations fundamentally alter the AR epigenomic and transcriptional program in a way that starts to mimic prostate cancer, with FOXA1 being kind of a, a dominant signal that we see. So the question is, what is the sort of clinical and translational uh, meaning of this? How does this uh, matter to patients potentially? So to approach this, uh, this is all work that was done by Deli Liu, who's a, a computational biology postdoc in my group. We uh, realized that we needed to take a surrogate marker approach to identify some of these tumors because to be able to study clinical outcomes in uh, clinically localized early prostate cancer, we actually need cohorts with decades of follow-up because the fact is men who get metastasis and die of prostate cancer often do so 10, 15, 20 years after they're originally diagnosed. So we used an approach to actually define transcriptional signatures for these different subtypes because we had access to data sets uh, for gene expression profiling where we did have that long follow-up that we didn't have with genomics alone. And I'll take you through that process a little bit here. So first, we uh, define gene expression signatures using the, the TCGA as a training cohort for uh, these different subtypes, and specifically for the SBOT mutant subtype. We validated that in internal RNA-seq cohorts, and then uh, used a uh, machine learning method to actually define a classifier that could call single samples as positive for an SBOT mutation or not, based on their gene expression profile. We then went on to confirm that this worked not just in RNA-seq, but also uh, in other data types like microarrays, and basically we're able to validate that it worked pretty well. So next, we uh, deployed this in collaboration uh, with GenomeDx, which is now Decipher Biosciences, which makes a clinically utilized uh, gene expression test um, that uses Affymetric microarrays as its gene expression profiling, and it's able to get transcriptome-wide profiling from these uh, patient tests. We looked at six retrospective cohorts of over 1,700 radical prostatectomy patients that had really decades of follow-up and really robust clinical annotation, and we used this classifier approach to define the molecular subtypes in this cohort. What we saw is that using our classifiers, uh, the breakdown of the molecular subtypes is about what we expected based on historical data. About 10% were predicted to be SPOT mutant, a little over 40% were ERG positive, all consistent with prior data. And so what we saw was like, first, if we looked at metastasis-free survival in these cohorts, the patients with SPOP mutant tumors did a little bit better than the patients with SPOP wild type tumors. And the same kind of signal we saw carried through to prostate cancer specific mortality, a little bit improvement in the SPOP mutant tumors. 
Now, consistent with that, when we looked at the clinical and pathological parameters of these cancers, that radical prostatectomy, we saw that the SPOT mutants were less likely to have extracapsular extension, less likely to have seminal vesicle invasion, uh, and all of that sort of fits with a little bit better prognosis for these tumors. What was interesting and didn't fit was that these tumors were also very likely to have much higher PSAs. So if you looked at PSA greater than 20, the SPOT mutants were much more likely to have high PSAs. That's interesting because uh, we use PSA as a biomarker for risk stratification. And typically higher PSAs are associated with higher stage and worse prognosis. But the fact is PSA is an angiogen receptor target gene. It's one of the classic angiogen receptor target genes. And so what we're seeing here is that from our model systems, we have a suggestion that the angiogen receptor transcriptional program is acting differently. And now we're seeing in human patient specimens that the biomarker that is an angiogen receptor target gene is no longer tracking with stage the way we sort of expect it to. We validated this in a prospective cohort of greater than 6,500 patients uh, and saw the same thing, that these SPOT mutants had high PSAs, but actually lower stage. And so this is sort of a glimpse into how these molecular, the underlying molecular features might start to contribute to how we think about um, clinical parameters, basically. And so what we think is happening here is we've identified that this subset of cancer that has altered androgen receptor signaling may actually be making more PSA for each cancer cell there is essentially. So there can be lower stage tumors that actually have higher PSA. In contrast, we actually see the opposite where the ERG positive tumors, they uh, make less PSA. So when you see an ERG positive tumor, with a high PSA, it's actually because there's a lot of cancer cells there essentially. And you can get a sense for how this might contribute to how we think about uh, changing the thresholds for these parameters for patients. You know, we use PSA for a lot. We use it for pretreatment risk stratification. We use it for post-treatment recurrence. We use it for treatment response and metastatic disease. So if the underlying biology of those tumors is different and affects how much PSA they're making, we may need to recalibrate how we're thinking about the PSA levels we use for each of these things. So next, I'd like to talk a little bit more about, okay, how does this mean, what does this mean for actually sensitivity to therapy for these tumors? Again, androgen receptor is a uh, very standard therapeutic target. It's the major therapeutic target, even in advanced disease. So one of the things we see is that in our mouse prostate organoids, we've seen that the SPOT mutant organoids are more sensitive to AR targeting therapy. You know, this example shown here is with biclutamide. This translates into in vitro as well. So if we look at the genetically engineered mouse models of SPOT mutant tumors, we've combined these in the past with uh, P10 deletions to help give us a more robust neoplastic phenotype. And essentially, I'll, I'll sort of go through this briefly, but basically when we castrate these mice, what we see is that the SPOP mutant contribution to the phenotypes goes away with castration, while the P10 dependent part of the phenotypes is relatively castration resistant. Again, consistent with the idea that these SPOP mutant models are more sensitive to therapies that modulate the androgen receptor. And so finally, we've looked at this in clinical uh, uh, cohorts. And so in the same sets of retrospective cohorts of uh, 1,700 radical prostatectomy patients, we annotated these for who received androgen receptor targeting therapy with androgen deprivation after uh, surgery and who didn't. And what we see is that the patients that had an SPOP mutant a tumor did considerably better when they received ADT, whereas patients that didn't receive ADT, there was no difference between the SBOP mutant and the SBOP wild type. So that's sort of one uh, 
piece of evidence in favor of these, again, these tumors in human patients being potentially more responsive to androgen targeting therapy. If we look at other data types, so if we just do a very simple analysis and look at the frequency of these SPOT mutations in primary clinically localized untreated prostate cancer compared to castration resistant prostate cancer that have become resistant to ADT, we see the amount of SPOT mutations is cut in about half, consistent with the idea that along the way, these uh, tumors essentially are being depleted by the ADT and disappearing from the population. If we look at uh, metastatic untreated cancers versus metastatic treatment resistant cancers, we see the same thing in, distinct, in, a, in another data set, where again, the SPOT mutants percentage is cut by about half, consistent with them maybe being selectively killed off by the ADT. And even in patients with very advanced treatment resistant, castration resistant prostate cancer. Uh, we continue to treat many of these patients with therapies targeting the androgen receptor in terms of next generation therapies like abiraterone and enzalutamide. And again, if we see a little bit better responses in those patients in the SPOP mutant tumors compared to the SPOP wild type, all consistent with the fact that there's improved response to AR targeting therapies really across multiple clinical scenarios in these tumors. Now, I think one of the important things to take home though is, you know, these patients do a little bit better, but they don't do well. So patients with metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer, the SPOP mutants have three to five months longer time to CRPC and two to three months longer overall survival. So again, this is not sort of a mission accomplished, oh, these tumors are exquisitely sensitive to ADT and it cures them. These patients do a little bit better, but again, it's, uh, there's still a lot of work to do even within this subclass to understand how to help them do well. So finally, in conclusion there, uh, again, in terms of the clinical impact we see and how it relates to uh, our model system. So we see favorable prognosis despite high PSA levels, which it has implications for risk stratification. And we see potential for differential responses to AR targeting therapy. And we have a lot of studies ongoing uh, models and tools in place to study these human populations and understand this a little bit better. So lastly, I wanna turn back to the idea of molecular classification and with the important point that there, a subclass is not defined or is not built completely on a single mutation or on a single driver event. So if we look at these classes of tumors and you look at the ERG positive tumors, you can see they're enriched for specific things. And particularly, they're enriched for deletions of P10, they're enriched for P53 alterations. In contrast, the SPOT mutant tumors are largely lacking those alterations, and instead they come with their own specific package of additional genomic alterations. And particularly, you can see this deletion of a nucleosome remodeler called CHD1. So uh, in work that's all been done by uh, Mike Algello, who's a postdoc that just left my lab, um, we looked at these CHD1 deletions more carefully. So here you can see the copy number profile of the SPOP mutant tumors and the SPOP wild type tumors. You can see they're very different in terms of the genomic alterations that come along with these SPOP mutations. This 5Q21 peak right there, which is one of the most common associated things, is where this gene called CHD1 resides. CHD1 is a nucleosome remodeler its canonical role, which has mostly been studied in stem cells, is to actually move nucleosomes around uh, in, you know, from the promoter to allow RNA's polymera uh, RNA polymerase II to escape the promoter and maximally allow efficient transcription. So just on the surface, it's hard to sort of think why that would be a tumor suppressor if, if it helps maximize efficient transcription. And interestingly, what we see is CHG1 does not look like a pan-cancer tumor suppressor. 
In fact, it looks highly specific to prostate cancer. So if we look across the whole spectrum of prostate cancers that have been studied in the TCGA, as well as in some of our internal cohorts at Cornell, the CHD1 deletions really happen in prostate cancer and not really anywhere else. So this is a prostate-specific tumor suppressor that even looks more specific that it happens primarily in these SPOT mutant tumors. So how can we learn a little bit more about what this does? So first, we, we developed a genetically engineered mouse model in where we uh, specifically deleted the CHC1 locus in a cre-inducible manner in the prostate. We can see that uh, by itself, it does very little, like a lot of sort of single hits in the prostate in the mouse. Whereas if we combine it with other things like P10 deletions, we can amplify neoplastic phenotypes. So it does look like a prostate-specific tumor suppressor that we can show in the mouse. Secondly, you know, in its canonical role, CHD1 binds to promoters, and primarily promoters marked by H3K4 trimethyl. And you can see that here in the, this is actually the PSA locus or KLK3, where CHD1 is here in blue, and if you overlay it, it's highly associated with H3K4 trimethyl. However, we also see it away from H3K4 trimethyl at places where androgen receptor is bound. So it's located essentially at androgen receptor bound enhancers. And if we look at the pattern there, uh, what Shirley Liu and other people have shown is that androgen receptor response elements and androgen receptor enhancers, when they become active, they sort of nucleosomes get moved out of the way and you get this sort of clean like peak and valley pattern. And when we look at the overlap of CHD1 with androgen receptor and with other associated transcription factors, we see that. We see CHD1 appears to be in this nice nucleosome remodeling pattern around the binding sites for these lineage-specific uh, androgen receptor-associated uh, enhancers. So what does then CHD1 actually do and why is it lost at these sites? So we have data from a couple different models that kind of showed us this. So first, we CRISPRed this out of LINCAP prostate cancer cells, and we saw an interesting, uh, interesting phenotype. Uh, what we see is that we know that we think of androgen as growth stimulatory for prostate cancer cells, and it is, but it can also be growth suppressive, particularly at higher doses. So here you see the higher doses of androgens, and LINCAPs don't like them. They actually stop growing if you give them higher doses of androgen. And what we saw with CHD1 deletion was that it loses the growth suppressive effects of androgens in these cells. We did a kind of a similar experiment in vivo in the genetically engineered mice where we deleted CHD1 with CRE, and we see a similar thing. So if you castrate these mice, and then give them back testosterone pellets and then look at their prostates a couple weeks later, deletion of CHD1 results in higher proliferation when we re-stimulate uh, these castrated prostates with testosterone. So again, consistent with the idea that CHD1 deletion results in the loss of the growth suppressive effects of androgen. So how is it doing this basically? Well, we did uh, chip seek for the androgen receptor uh, in the setting of CHD1 deletion. And what we see is a redistribution of androgen receptor. Essentially, androgen receptor moves away from classic androgen receptor response elements and AR half sites. And it actually is, becomes more associated with HOXB13 motifs. Now, as I mentioned before, HOXB13 is associated with prostate, uh, prostate cancer syndrome for the androgen receptor. So the idea here is that when we delete CHD1, the androgen receptor gets redistributed away from some of the more growth suppressive programs and towards some of the more oncogenic programs that are associated with HOXB13. And we can, we can validate those ToxB13 effects by looking at uh, prior published ToxB13 chip seek and see that the sites where androgen receptor goes to when we delete CHD1 are highly similar to the sites where androgen receptor goes to when ToxB13 is overexpressed in a couple of different settings.
And so finally, we took a look at this in human tumors. Uh, we collaborated with Wilbert Zwarts group from the Netherlands, who had done a very nice job of uh, profiling uh, primary tumors with androgen receptor chip -C. We're able to annotate his cohort for CHC1 deleted versus CHC1 intact tumors, and then look at the different motifs where the androgen receptor was, was bound. And again, if we look at the CHD1 deleted tumors, those tumors are enriched for HOXB13 motifs, while the CHD1 wild type tumors, the androgen receptor uh, peaks were more enriched for classic androgen receptor response elements and AR half sites. Again, consistent the idea that in both our model systems and in the human tumors, that CHD1 deletion is diverting androgen receptor away from the growth suppressive ARE associated program and more towards a HOXB13 dependent oncogenic program. So, so next, the question is, okay, we see SPOT mutations and CHT1 deletions, they occur together. And again, you know, in a, the other subclass of cancers, ERG positive cancers, they seem to happen with P10 deletions are the things that are most commonly associated with these. So how do we sort of think about these associated events? How do we understand the nature of why they're associated? And I think one of the critical things to think about is the element of time here. So uh, you can imagine that the timeline of these events could be very ordered. One thing could always happen first and one thing could always follow, or they could be random. They could happen in, in you know, either order, basically. And so if we think about that, that early versus latent prostate cancer, there's a couple different ways to look at this. Um, you know, you can imagine from both sequencing and from looking at precursors to prostate cancer, you may see that some mutations are happening very early in the natural history of the cancer, where they're just starting out the cells to act abnormal. Some mutations can happen very late in the transition from, you know, an established cancer to a more invasive cancer or a metastatic cancer. And by a number of these metrics, uh, we see that both ERG alterations and SPOP mutations appear to happen very early in the natural history of this disease. And so, you know, I won't go into the data here, but, you know, it's again work by Deli Liu, where we've sort of started to define what happens early and what happens late. And, you know, from a, a number of lines of evidence that have been previously published in the field, it's pretty well established that ERG alterations happen early and P10 deletions happen later in these tumors. We see a similar thing in the other subclass of tumor, where SPOT mutations appear to happen early and CHD1 deletions appear to happen later in those tumors. So the question we wanted to ask was, is this actually clinically meaningful? You know, you could, in a hand-waving speculative way, you'd be like, well, if it's acquiring a second hit, that tumor's getting worse. But can we actually see evidence of that in clinical data? So we turned back to our uh, transcriptional classifier approach and used the same sort of approach that I described, but we built sort of four different states here. We built two early mutually exclusive states, either ERG positive or SPOT mutant. And then we built classifiers for the later state where a P10 deletion that has, you know, followed from an ERG uh, positive tumor or a CHD1 deletion that came after the SPOT mutation. And so we took uh, these, built these transcriptional classifiers and then built a decision tree, essentially, where we go step by step and say, okay, ERG positive or not. All right, if it's ERG positive, P10 deleted or not. And a similar thing in the other subclass of tumors, the, uh, the CHD1 and SPOP tumors. And so what we see here is when we look at those same retrospective cohorts I've been describing, we see the breakdown of sort of different uh, states within these tumors, early and late, ERG positive, P10 deleted, SPOT mutant, CHD1 deleted. And what we see if we look at the metastasis-free survival according to these states, so we see that first, the early states both do considerably better 
and the late states both do considerably worse. Consistent with the idea that you know, the acquisition of a second hit in these tumors looks like it's associated with higher metastatic potential. Secondly, it looks like if you superimpose these curves, they're nearly identical. So you can argue that it appears that it doesn't matter which subtype the tumor is, but it matters more where along the timeline within that subtype it is. And so finally, we were looking at uh, the clinical and pathologic features we see here. And essentially what we're doing is we're comparing the late subtype within each back to its own early. So the, you know, the P10 deleted back to ERG positive, the CHD1 deleted back to SPOP mutant. And what we see is that in the ERG positive tumors that acquire a P10 deletion, we see these tumors get worse in terms of higher grade and higher stage, more extra capsular extension, more seminal vesicle invasion, more lymph node invasion. In contrast, in the other tumors, we don't see that. We see the grade get worse, but we see no changes at all in terms of the stage at prostatectomy. You know, consistent with the idea that despite these having very equivalent metastatic potential, they may have sort of different modes of progression towards that metastatic potential, where the ERG positive tumors may have a step where they go through higher local regional stage, more bulk, bulky regional disease, whereas the SPOT mutant tumors, we don't really see that. We don't see a change in stage, despite the fact that they have the equivalent amount of distant metastasis. And so just to wrap up here, I'm hoping I can kind of give you a glimpse here that by studying the underlying genomic features of these tumors, we can really get some insight into really variable biology here between them. And biology, you know, I'm one of those people that, that makes the argument that biology is king and biology drives everything. And when we think about what we're doing in terms of prostate cancer, there's a lot of things that biology can drive, you know, distinct progression events within these tumors, how we think about our biomarkers like PSA, how we interpret stage across different tumor types, whether this drives different patterns of metastasis based on the underlying tumor features, and how we think about treatment responses. So finally, I just want to acknowledge, you know, as you can imagine, all these projects, these are very much team science projects. Um, you know, everything that me and my lab group did is dwarfed by the amount of contributions from our collaborators. So I do want to thank all the members of my own lab group, uh, all our collaborators at Wild Cornell who are critical, and our collaborators really, you know, across the country and elsewhere. Um, so thank you all very much for your attention, and I'm happy to take a few questions if we have time.